Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, third and final day of the annual meeting of the New Champions 2015. Delighted to be here with our first issue briefing of the day. We have two today. We're, we're going to move from science to innovation, with our second one being about the shadow banking and uh, technological disruption in the finance industry. But first, very, very pleased to be joined by some of the World Economic Forum's community of young scientists all brilliant scientists in their own right. And we're hoping the network effect of having them as part of the, the, you know, the World Economic Forum's community here, that there's, a, there's some, some synergies that can be gained from bringing these brilliant people together. I was able to capture four of them, um, and, and here they are now, our, our captives for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to start in true fashion for these issue briefings with uh, a, a, a brief round of questions for each of them, and then we're going to open up the questions to the floor and also to our audience who are watching live online. I'm going to start with Mandy Holford. You're Associate Professor of Chemical Biology, Hunter, Hunter College at the City University of New York, doing a lot of work in the, in the field of, of, of using uh, killer snails and, and capturing their venom for the good of mankind. Give us your brief elevator pitch. My brief elevator pitch is uh, killer cure. So the snails that we work with, they're lethal. They have a venom like snakes or scorpions, so they can kill you, but that venom can also cure. And so in the venom, they've evolved over millions of years to hit specific targets, which is what drugs do. If you have a headache, you take an aspirin because you want to alleviate your headache. You want it to get rid of your headache quickly, you want it to only get rid of your headache, and you don't want it to cause any side effects. And that's what these, um, the, the, the peptides in these uh, snails are able to do for us. They're showing us new drug therapies that are going to be both specific, fast acting, and alleviate side effects. And, 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 and what kind of, what kind of um, treatments are these? These, these peptides going to be useful? So the first one, as sort of our proof in principle, there's a snail drug on the market right now used to treat chronic pain in HIV and cancer patients. And um, the one that's being developed in my lab, we found one that seems to be very selective for liver cancer. So it runs the gambit between uh, pain and, and cancer, and that's because they're basically good at shutting down signals. So if you think that pain is a chronic signal that's going through your neurons, your neuronal signals, and uh, cancer is a chronic signal that's going through the cells to divide, these peptides work in the same way to shut down or to inhibit those malfunctioning signals so that you can um, alleviate the disorder that's occurring. And we've had painkillers around for a while. What mm -hmm. makes these different? So the, the, the painkillers that are coming from venomous snails are different because they don't target the same thing. So most of the painkillers on the market are opioid acting, so they're opioid receptors, and they have the same, uh, a major side effect in that they're addictive. So the painkillers we're finding from these snails are not addictive because they don't work on opioid receptors. They work on a different molecular target, and this target um, doesn't go along the addiction pathway. And so that's one major breakthrough. The other is that they're, they're very potent. So um, the, the current painkiller morphine loses its potency over time. You never get back to that original high, as they like to say. Um, but the peptides from these snails aren't, don't behave in that way. They're, they don't lose their high. And so they're much more potent than morphine. They're longer lasting in the therapeutic uh, application. And, and they're not addictive. So basically, they've shown us a new model for how to treat pain which prior to discovering these snails, no one knew about. Wow, okay, that is actually genuinely fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I hope there are enough snails to go around to, yes. to, to, to kill, kill all the pain in the world. <laughs> Louis Philippe, yeah, you're, um, you're very, your, your, your work is at the intersection of two sciences, uh, artificial intelligence and, and life science and healthcare, if I'm not mistaken. It's yeah. very true to the concept and, 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 and philosophy of the forum, which is bringing different disparity, disparity of communities and, and yeah. skill sets together. Tell us a bit about your work. Yeah, I think this is one of the really exciting things right now is to uh, see the intersection of computer science and healthcare, uh, what two different fields coming together. Uh, and now these days we can see computer science helping uh, doctors in their diagnosis and their treatment of depression, uh, different mental health issues like psychosis and autism. Uh, this field, which is called multimodal AI, is really, I think, the equivalent of the blood sample. 
the I think this is the best analogy I have is like you you have in many cases if you have a doctor and you want to confirm your hypothesis about a patient you will order a blood sample and a blood test and you get the the results you we we want to do the same with mental health so that we have an interaction sample where the person is talking and we are able to quantify their nonverbal behavior how they smile how they are voicing different and how we can see that over time and so that the doctors can have objective measures for something that has been really subjective mental health disorders and and, and what kind of uh, disorders are you hoping to target first or what, what's this, what's the stage of your uh, bringing this to you know to uh, into practice and to everyday usage yeah, so we started with uh, distress, depression, and anxiety. And one of the really interesting things, we were so sure that people who are depressed smile less often. But in fact, they smile as often because of social norm, but their smile are shorter and less amplitude. We also thought that there was a difference with negative uh, uh, facial expression, but in fact, there is the same between distress and non-distress. But if you separate men and women, what you see is that women are showing less negative facial expression, while men are showing more negative facial expression when they're depressed. So these tools have a real impact. We can now observe things that were subtle and could, may not have been able to be seen in a large scale. And so now we're doing with autism, uh, with Yale Medical School, and we're working with Harvard Medical School uh, with psychosis. And these are amazing avenue for the future, yes. It sounds like interpreting these expressions, there's a commercial interest outside of medicine and healthcare as well. I think this is clearly really important when you think about treatment. There are a lot of drugs developed these days, and when you think about mental health, you want to be able to know if this drug has an impact, and you would like to reduce the time of treatment, and so that you don't have to wait uh, the usual six weeks. If it's working, you would like to be able to have these objective measures that allows you to reduce that. So it has a really big impact for a medication and all these pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and I think this is going to be an area of great interest in the future. Any, any other industries outside of pharmaceuticals? Uh, definitely in education. So one of the areas where all of this research is going now is looking at education because now these days you have online learning where people are working together from really different uh, uh, areas of the world, and uh, we're good face to face. We're having a great conversation. How can we have this great conversation online and be able to have a really engaging conversation and le increasing learning? Uh, massive online learning courses are a first baby step, but I think there's a lot more to be done, and I think part of the answer will be in the, this nonverbal multimodal area. That's great, and I'm terrible. I, I didn't even introduce you. The, the <laughs> protocol is just something I've got to get better at. Louis Philippe Merens, you're the assistant professor at Language Technology Institute School of Computer Science, Carnegie Mellon University. Thanks for that. We'll be coming back to you no soon. A uh, good friend of ours here in the issue briefing room, Yota uh, Puirazi. Uh, you're the research director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, the Foundation for Research and Technology in Greece. Yota, you were here last year, this is your second AMNC, and you were arguing about the um, uh, memory associations and uh, being a, a good way of optimizing memory capacity. How has your work developed since then? So uh, I'm mostly interested like, about understanding the mechanisms that underlie our ability to form new memories and what goes wrong when we can't remember very well. So uh, last year I explained that uh, we have developed some strategies in order to improve the way we store information, and this is by trying to associate items with a context or um, similar views of the same subject so that we can remember it better. So since then, what we have been doing in my lab is to try to develop models, computational models that simulate these processes so that we are able to identify the mechanisms at the very low level, starting from the molecules and the structure that are mostly responsible for memory formation. And the aim here is to replace essentially what people are doing now in a wet lab, where you have to slice a brain and stick electrodes into it in order to record the activity and understand how the whole system works. But if you can instead provide a model, a computational model, where it's used in a similar manner, but not invasively, and much more easily, if you like, to understand, if you perform a causal manipulation, what would be the effect 
on the processing of the brain and what will be the effect on the, our ability to learn new memories, then it's much easier to proceed to new treatments or even incorporate these mechanisms into anti artificial intelligent agents. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this way, we're essentially zooming in, compared to Louis, um, Philippe, we are zooming into the mechanisms of the processing in the brain and uh, trying to understand how they work so that we can then translate this understanding into new treatments or smarter robots, if you like. Okay, fantastic. Do you work with roboticists? So uh, there's lots of talk of, uh, of, of robots being in the, in the middle of a lot of various disciplines. Uh, we had some robot experts here on, on Wednesday, I believe. Is that an area you're, you're, you're looking into at the moment? Not right now, but in the near future, once we have something that is easier to apply into uh, a machine than probably, but we're still right now trying to understand the mechanisms that are behind this, the molecular mechanisms. So I would say that we're closer to the uh, pharmaceutical industry than the artificial intelligence field, sure. because we're mostly capable to identify key elements that are responsible for memory loss, and those can serve as targets for new treatments. And I think it's good that you're looking after humans before robots first. I, I like your, <laughs> I like your prioritisation there. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go back to one of the comments we had on social media about about um, you know, the field you're in and about implanting false memories and uh, conjuring up ideas such as films like in Inception. Uh, is this a, is this a worry that the, the work you're doing could be could have negative consequences? Well, as my strong belief is that any kind of technology that is frontier and far advanced for what, from what we have today, it uh, consists of both risks and great benefits. So I'd like to think of the benefits than the risks. And I think of such a technology, if we had it, which essentially would be the ability to manipulate the formation of memories in humans in a non-invasive matter and implant new ones or better way to say it would be to delete the ones we don't want, because that's a, a most important application of such a technology. It would be a great advantage for, for people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, when you can turn something really negative into something that is really positive. Of course, there are serious wo worries related to such a technology, which if it goes to the wrong hands, then you essentially would be able to manipulate people in different ways. Uh, but I think we'd, we're a little bit far from that. Okay, cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> yeah. I Ivana Kujanski, you are the Assistant Professor R&D Centre for Bioengineering at Belgrade Metropolitan University. Welcome again. I believe it's your second you. AMNC as well. Yes, it is. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. And you're, yeah, it's very interesting for us because you're a scientist, but you're also practicing in encouraging entrepreneurship in, in, in Serbia. Yes. How, do you do, how do you split your time? Tell us about your work. Yes, uh, I basically work along two lines. One is uh, still basic research. I work on tissue engineering. I started on uh, bone and cartilage engineering when I was at Columbia University during the Fulbright Fellowship. Now back in Serbia, I work uh, more on blood vessel engineering and uh, the idea is to actually, you, you need vascularization always in tissue engineering, so that is definitely something that can be integrated with other fields of tissue engineering. And the other line is the work on um, fab labs and uh, fab labs stand for a fabrication laboratory, which is actually a workspace for a digital fabrication, which means uh, the use of uh, 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters. Uh, it's a concept that started at uh, MIT and uh, it spread uh, now globally. And in Serbia, they're not yet uh, functional fab labs, but we are starting. We actually now are establishing educational fab lab, which means that we will have uh, teachers and high school uh, children uh, being educated there, how to use 3D printers, how to use CNC machines, how to actually make uh, things on their own. And the idea is also to integrate uh, this kind of uh, new knowledge into the official uh, uh, STEM education. So this is what I'm really enthusiastic about. And there is a strong connection of fab labs and entrepreneurship. Because uh, especially for uh, hardware-oriented startups, fab labs are a great place to, to do the rapid prototyping. You can really uh, make uh, your MVP, minimum viable product, in a very fast way, and you can do really uh, fast iterations. So it can really speed up the process uh, of uh, yeah, prototyping your product. And also it's a good way uh, to connect uh, science and entrepreneurship, because scientists uh, can come to fab labs and uh, interact with the uh, 
uh, entrepreneurs working there, and uh, that, that's a very powerful combination. Uh, we had a great session here, Partnering for Science, which is all about uh, connections between scientists and industry, and uh, I feel it's a little bit easier if it's one-on-one, -on -one. so you have uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you have scientists talking to each other, like literally, one-on-one, -on -one. and you can also have uh, pitching competitions, you, you can have VCs uh, coming to Fab Labs, that's actually what's happening in, uh, in the Fab Labs in, um, in Europe. And uh, we are starting also a large project on uh, making the um, network of Southeast Europe Fab Labs. So I, I'm really looking forward to that. And I think it's a good way for um, kickstarting the economy, which is a big issue in, in Serbia. So it's also a big issue for uh, science uh, because of the budget cuts. And I think that's basically a universal problem, budget cuts for science. And this is a good way to, uh, to well, help uh, science. Uh, the Fab Labs can be used to make uh, uh, low cost but research grade equipment. So that's also something we've been uh, working on. Especially for Serbia, it's, it's important because it's so hard to, to get uh, uh, really cutting edge equipment and uh, I think this is a way to, to overcome these problems. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point. Let, let's stay on that point here because we are at a meeting where we're bringing together business leaders and yeah. policy makers and regulators and, and scientists and, and yeah. startups and, 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 and larger businesses as well. What have, you, what have you, your experiences been of um, talking to, to business leaders? Do you think there's enough collaboration, collaborative spirit at the moment? Is there any areas that need improvement for, for bridging? And I appreciate a lot of your research is very much at the frontiers, but any, any, uh, any experiences from conversations you've had with, with with other stakeholders? Yeah, I think right now there's an exciting time because I think there's a genuine interest in trying to figure out how do we go from bench to market more efficiently, more successfully, using initiatives like Ivana's Fab Labs, trying to do the drug discovery process like our work in a way that scales up in both a rapid and effective manner. And so in, in talking to policymakers and, and and um, business leaders here at the meeting, that's sort of what I've been trying to figure out. And, and we had a great session, um, yep. the YS, about going from bench to market and figuring out if you have a clever idea or if you have a concept, what's the best way? Who should be on your team? Who do you reach out to? And how do you identify those people? And so that's where I think this kind of um, a conference is powerful because it's, it gets us access to be in the room with the business leaders yeah. so that you can talk about what's happening. And not only talk about what's happening, but in practical terms, discuss what should be the benchmarks. How do I go next? How do I form my team? And how do I make sure that what I'm thinking about actually will make it to the market and have impact when it gets there? So it's not dead on arrival kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now in general, regardless of the field you're in, whether it's you know what I'm doing in drug discovery, yeah. what you're doing with AI, your work as well in memory and the fab labs, industries are now actively coming to us and trying to pursue and figure out models for how we can scale this in a way that makes sense and where you don't require you becoming you know super person right so mm -hmm. you don't have to be the scientist the ceo and mm -hmm. the policy decision maker all mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. you can effectively partner and work strategically to get mm -hmm. these things to scale in a much more efficient manner that, that was what i was thinking because that was the, what you were saying is there's an awful lot for you guys to do you know you right. have to you, know, you have to be a business <laughs> strategist right, exactly. you have to be it's not possible a, a financier as well as a brilliant scientist exactly. and frankly i'm sure we'd rather keep you in, in science everyone maybe wants you'll me be in a science good fin <laughs> maybe you'll be a good financier who knows maybe <laughs> we'll never know but I mean that's a very good point is that, is that your experience too that you're getting more interest now from business and, uh, and, and other stakeholders recognizing your work and recognizing commercial potential for science I think one point I think that, uh, related to that is the the fact that uh, as scientists um, our job is yes to discover to, to push the boundary but um, what I think I got that, that was my first time at the World Economic Forum is the idea of it's a two-way dialogue mm -hmm. and if you stay and you just uh, stay by yourself and you're not uh, ready to make the next step uh, you cannot complain you have to be part of the dialogue mm -hmm. and so you have to make the effort to make your research accessible uh, and uh, and so that the dialogue can start that's a first step is just make it accessible uh, and take the time to understand the other side because mm -hmm. Uh, you come in and uh, so uh, I think this was the really interesting in that sense that the dialogue that we uh, uh, that is happening here is is a two-way dialogue and uh, and I can see uh, there is interest on both sides 
but um, uh, it was a great opening for me, uh, Luke, coming here for that reason, yeah. Let's take your, the, the example you gave us of your work, and, and primarily it was for treatment of mental disorder, but you also said um, massively open online courses. Is it another application? I'm kind of thinking maybe audience measurement as well. That could be quite a good one too. Uh, but was that your idea? Did people come to you and say, Louis Philippe, let's, do, let, let's use this for education too? Or is, it, is that an idea you had? The, the original, I, can, I cannot over underemphasize uh, collaboration. And uh, I think a lot of my work will never have been possible without all, um, all my collaborators and this multidisciplinarity that has become key to research these days. And so when uh, I cannot, I'm here in front uh, of, of the audience, but I really believe that there is a momentum in the scientific community towards that. And I'm probably one who is pushing that, but there's a lot of other people there. Uh, education uh, was early on when I wanted, uh, when I, I always love, I think, I think we're all in research, part of it to discover, but it's to work with students. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the reason I, I love this work, is, is the working with students to help them. So this was from day one, something I want to do, is help them learn, and not just my students, but also other students from other country, other university. So that was always a goal for me. Uh, now I'm glad I can start addressing it, uh, but I think anybody in research, I mean, we, we're doing it. Uh, I mean, my students are really doing the work. Uh, we're working as a team together. And so I think education has always been there. But a lot of the new ideas that I didn't think about, job interview training, uh, uh, that's the kind of feedback I'm getting here. A lot of other applications that I had not thought about, and that's really exciting. And now I have to think about <laughs> how I'm going to take that. But it, it is really interesting to get that feedback. Something for a plane ride home. You've got lots yeah. of ideas. You can start processing. <laughs> yeah. Yotra, have you had any meaningful conversations with people outside the scientific community here this oh, week? Oh yeah, and that's one of the things I really like about this meeting is that you get an opportunity, a huge opportunity to to meet with uh, policymakers, with publishers, with uh, uh, young global leaders, and, and exchange ideas of how to uh, proceed further. So I thought, for me, it was ben very beneficial to have a discussion with policymakers where we are trying to get across some of our needs for a change in the scientific field, especially the young generation. I think there are many things that we would like to have them different in the way we have we do our research and how uh, people uh, appreciate our work or how do we judge excellence, how do we publish. These are some of the issues that we had the opportunity here to um, uh, communicate to the people who are mostly responsible to drive this change. So this, I think, was really great. Uh, in terms of interaction with the uh, industry, I would personally would like to have more of it. I mean, it, it was great uh, the talking to people over parties uh, last night <laughs> about whether my idea is really good for a new company, for example, and there, were, there was interest. Uh, but I would like to have a, a more organized uh, you know, twinning between the mm -hmm. industry and the science community, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps in this forum or somewhere else. I think it is a great uh, opportunity and we should capitalize on it, having these people mm -hmm. together that both can contribute to each other. It's a very, it's a very good idea. Ivana, you've been, you've been working on this on, on your, on, yeah, in your, your home country. What, what's been your, your greatest learning about trying to build this, this community together where investors and scientists can, 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 yeah, can, can share the same platform? Yes, well, that, that's always a challenge. It's still a challenge, and it helps a lot uh, having, uh, as Yota mentioned now, this, uh, this opportunity here to actually talk to, to the investors, to the policymakers. And uh, I, was, I was very happy to be at the, um, one of the main sessions. Uh, Professor Klaus Schwab was chairing it about the next industrial revolution because uh, these technologies, uh, digital fabrication and the maker movement, the fab labs, that's part of the next industrial revolution. And uh, that brings along a lot of different aspects. Uh, uh, the questions of uh, IP, intellectual property, like because everything is open source, so who's actually the owner of the product that you make? And uh, there are also different, um, different aspects of uh, well, if you now go to the more scientific side, because I'm also using these uh, digital fabrication technologies in, um, 
my biology research because there is 3D bioprinting, so we are establishing a facility for this. And there are also these ethical uh, questions also concerning this. Uh, when you make a new tissue, a new organ, what, what are the, again, ownership uh, issues about that? So it's a lot of, the, the whole field of regenerative medicine is very, yeah, uh, charged with the uh, ethical issues and I, I was again very happy to see uh, a lot of discussions also this year and last year. Last year was a very good session on bioengineering in, in general and um, uh, bioprinting in particular and uh, if, if you told me before that at the World Economic Forum there would be so much talk about uh, cutting-edge science I, I wouldn't have believed it and uh, now when I witnessed it firsthand I'm I'm so positively surprised and it's really, really great, which shows that it's really going in the right direction. Really, really close interaction of science and business. So that's what we are aiming, all of us, aiming to do. And it's really good that now we have this community of us, young scientists, and uh, we really are trying to connect also with the other, other uh, communities. And uh, I think we will we'll make something great. Definitely. I'd like to add that, yeah, I also <laughs> yeah. was at the Professor Klaus's se session on the industrial, um, the new industrial revolution that's coming forward. Yeah. And, and because it's going to be so tech heavy, it sort of goes to a point that um, Louis was bringing up just now about education. So how are we going to educate the next generation of young yeah. scientists? That's not a topic that's, that's a WEF topic, but um, the topic is directly pertinent to economies yeah. and keeping economies sustainable. Yeah. And so how do we engage new, new scientists and new STEMs in a global scale? And so one project that we're trying to do in, in my group, um, we're, we're calling it the Killer Snails project, right? Because <laughs> Killer Snails gets people's hey, attention. It's a good brand. <laughs> exactly. It does. And so we're trying to figure out not only yeah. how um, students learn uh, about science, but why, which, which components is it that they start to internalize, and how do you make it, how do you put, and, and so it's in the form of a digital learning games that, that we're putting out there. So because AI and, and digital is so effective for the young generation, if you have a child, they grab your iPhone and they, they know what to do with it. So we're trying to come up with materials that engages on that level what we can do to ensure that in the industrial revolution, everyone sort of has an opportunity to play. And it's not just the, the, the high-end economies, but the low-end economies as sure. well sure. that should be able to be there. So education is key, and how do we figure out you know, how to engage um, young scientists to, to give back in that realm as well. Education and low cost research grade right. re that's research. That's a you know, good mix. Think, you so. can also uh, print on a 3D printer very yes. beautiful <laughs> nails, right? A couple <laughs> of minutes. I can spare, spend all, all day here, but, but you've got to go. But a couple of quick questions first. I mean, what, let's go back to the fun stuff. So, outside of your own field of science, what's been mostly exciting for you? What other sciences are really inspiring you at the moment, Louis? Uh, oh, I think right now there is, um, there was for a while uh, in artificial intelligence really establish uh, discipline, language, speech, computer vision, uh, air, machine learning. Uh, and now multimodal is, is becoming. So the dream, if you look at AI, artificial intelligence from 1950s, uh, they were supposed to solve it in 20 years. That was their research <laughs> agenda. We know it's not going to happen. I hope it doesn't happen right right now. But uh, well, what happened is the multidisciplinarity is, is, is now everybody agree. And it's not just they agree, but they're doing it. And I think that's the main difference. Everybody knew it was important, but now it is happening. It is happening where one, now we understand about language, we understand how people are talking, where they speak. And we are, and also social aspects. So the group dynamics. So we really see this fusion that comes because there has been this dialogue for a long time. There has been new policies, and the funding agency has seen it. So that will has been going on for a while, long time, and now it has real effect, and that's really exciting. That multidisciplinarity is real for now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so what's exciting you outside of uh, the memory work you're doing? Well, I think. I will stick to the neuroscience because I think it's the decade of the brain. 
And what I find really fascinating is the fact that there is a, um, a worldwide effort in multiple countries to try to do basic research in order to understand the brain and how it works. And to do that, you have to go through the development of new technologies, which contribute to many other areas. You have the people that work you know, uh, on experiments, collaborating with people developing new technologies, collaborating with uh, modelers, and everyone is chipping in into this great effort which is essentially to map the human brain within the next, I don't know, 50 to 100 years. And um, I find it fascinating because it is, I think, for the first time, uh, um, an activity where it is multidisciplinary, it is cross-scale, it, it, it leads to new the development of new technologies, it leads to the application of the new technologies in an immediate uh, time frame. So it, it is an activity that encompasses pretty much everything we dream of in, in science. And I think we will have a, a revolution in, uh, uh, in brain uh, science in the next few years, and I find that fascinating. And it's global, as you were and saying. And it's global, It's an initiative yeah. that, that uh, several countries have taken up all at the same time, which is powerful because, yeah. as we know, when, when scientists collaborate, we tend to get the best ideas forward. And the fact that the brain, um, you're calling it the decade of the brain, <laughs> but the fact that the brain initiative has been um, taken on, because the brain is the ultimate frontier, kind of like space. So for me, the things that are, I'm excited about, in, in, including the Brain Initiative, is what's happening in space. So Pluto, if everyone saw the flyby, <laughs> Pluto is amazing. And I think yeah. the technology development that's enabling us to get there, so we're learning that we can do these things faster and, and better. Yeah, and I absolutely. think that's really exciting. And, and on a, such a tiny level, so we're doing a lot of single cell research as well, where before we had to cluster everything and get general pictures of what's going on. Now we can get specific information about a single cell, and, and that's really powerful. And, and zoom in and zoom out at the same exactly. time, mm -hmm. which is really amazing. Now we have the power to do that. Ivana, last question. We, we hope you come back in a year's time. What would you, in the best case scenario, hope to have had achieved? What, what do you want to achieve in the next 12 months? In the next 12 months? Uh, <laughs> I'm not giving you, I'm very, very tight with yeah. my time. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, it's good to go backwards, just to compare how it was last year and then what happened in these yeah. 12 months. Uh, it actually moved along quite well, uh, the nonprofit that I founded in the meantime, uh, which is its fab initiative, it's focused on establishing fab labs. And what happened in the past uh, year is that we started the educational fab lab in Serbia, the first one. And uh, I have to say that uh, being a young scientist from uh, World Economic Forum helped a lot mm -hmm. in uh, fundraising and getting uh, really good grants. So that is what happened and uh, I would be very happy if that trend continues so we make n more <laughs> new fab labs so that would be really good. And um, also what happened is that, uh, okay, maybe n not everything is so positive so on the negative side is that my startup failed. So, but that's also a very good uh, experience, learning experience. Like everybody says, failure is nothing to be feared. It's not pleasant but it's also great learning. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about starting a, a new one. So I'm maybe going to do that in the next 12 months. Although, of course, you have to focus. So I'm probably going to do it through the Fab Lab, so integrate. And uh, I'm also looking forward to collaboration with the other young scientists. I mean, Mandy and I, we already started talking about, I like these killer snails a lot. <laughs> so yeah, and also this about neuroscience. I mean, I actually have a PhD in neuroscience, so I might get back to that. <laughs> So there's like plenty of opportunities yeah. for, for future collaboration. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you to our audience watching live on weforum.org. This session is now closed.